hardly going where no science show has gone before. The Naked Scientists. Hello, welcome to this week's Naked Scientists with Kat Arney. Hello. And Dave Ansell. Hi there. And I'm Chris Smith. Now this week we'll be finding out how unmanned, unmanned aeroplanes could soon be shuttling urgent samples from patients to remote places in testing labs. We'll also be finding out how internet anti-spam systems are helping researchers to decode old documents and manuscripts. And getting to the heart of a coronary, we'll be hearing how a new way has come about to reduce the damage that's being done by heart attacks. That's all on the way, Kat. Thanks, Chris. This week, it's also our science question and answer show, so we'll be tackling your science questions, including finding out why we stop noticing smells after a short time. Mm, yes, you do. Why different shaped objects thrown into a pond always produce circular ripples, and how does a Newton's cradle work? That's the thing with the silver flicky balls that you find on important people's desks. We'll also be shedding some light on this illuminating question. Hi, I'm Sandra and I'm calling from Melbourne. I was just wondering, is there any radiation that would come from a glow-in-the-dark watch that could be harmful to the wearer? Greggy, so how do glow-in-the-dark things glow and are they dangerous? Diana O'Carroll will be here with the answer later in the programme. Dave. Thanks, Kat. And in this week's Kitchen Science, I'll be challenging you to impale a potato with a drinking straw. Find out why in a few minutes. <laughs> Cutting-edge research here on The Naked Scientist, Dave. That's all on the way. If you've got a question for us, and the wackier the better, of course, email chris at thenakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientist podcast, powered by UK Fast, the UK's best hosting provider. On the web at ukfast.net. Now, if you live in a rural area, um, and you should know that everything's a long way apart, and especially in developing countries where roads are awful and it can take hours and hours to get even only maybe 10 or 15 miles. Now, this is bad enough in everyday life, but if you imagine the problem if you're in a clinic... You want to get some tests back for a patient who might be dying. You need to know what those results are. It's going to take two or three days to get the results back. It's not going to be very good for the patient. Now, Barry Mendelow of the South African National Health Laboratory Surface has a solution to this problem. Basically, spy planes, not the big ones costing millions of pounds, um, but small, uncrewed aerial vehicles um, that have been developed for soldiers to be able to see over the next hill so they can work out who to shoot and who to, when to run away. Um, these are basically like radio-controlled planes, but with a computer and a GPS system so they're essentially autonomous and can fly a pre-programmed course over maybe about 50 kilometres at 45 kilometres an hour. How big are they, Dave? Um, these things, are, um, depends on the size. They've been building two, two of them. One, some of them are sort of maybe um, sort of about 80 centimetres wingspan. Other, there's a bigger version with sort of a couple of metre wingspan. And how are they controlled? Um, basically, you plug them into a computer. Uh, I think they might even be able to be programmed for, by a mobile phone. Um, you give them a set of GPS coordinates that will fly from one GPS coordinate to another. So first of all, you take the plane, you fill it with the samples you want to take, um, you then set it off, and then flies over to the place where it's supposed to be, and then automatically drops the cargo onto the, cl- onto the lab, um, then it flies back to you so you can catch it. And then the lab um, does the analysis, and then SS- SMSs you with the results. Quick question, how, how does the land safely though okay. um it depends on they've got doing two versions there's a big one which basically you have to get radio controls out to land fairly um smoothly and gently and there's a small version which is basically can fly so can fly so slowly that it can just basically land on a flattish piece of ground and how much does it cost because i guess cost is a key question isn't it um these sort of things uh, they vary in price quite a lot um the military ones are sort of maybe ten thousand um, pounds but if you if you made a lot of them they could probably be down to about a thousand pounds if you did a lot of them so this is not something although africa would like this it's maybe not something they can afford mm, possibly not to start with until you start if you started mass producing them then you probably could but to start off with it would probably be rural areas in places with some money but not probably not none certainly a natty idea though excellent yeah next anyone who's a regular web user will be familiar with the capture those are that that's the little box of really weird letters that you have to type out in order to get access to certain web pages. It's for security. Now, CAPTCHA stands for Completely Automated Public Turing Test to tell computers and humans apart. And it's a really effective security measure because it means a computer system can tell if you're a real person or if you're a spam bot. You know, these programs that trawl the internet. Now, researchers from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh have harnessed this technology for a rather unusual end, and that's transcribing old texts from printed material into digital format. It's the the big thing now, trying to put lots of books, texts, manuscripts online in digital format so people can search them and, and see them. And they've decided to use this capture system. So using it, the researchers have been asking computer users to decipher scanned words from books that can't be recognised by current computer 
computer recognition systems. And the team found that this method had an accuracy of more than 99%, and that's at least as good as a professional human transcriber. So what, they get lots of people to do it more than once um, to make as, sure they get it right? As far as I know, yeah. So you, you'd get a little chunk of, of some letters and you just have to type them in. And currently the system is being used in more than 40,000 websites and it's been used to transcribe over 440 million words. So it's a, a pretty clever solution, I think. How do, they, how do they know that you've typed it in right if they can't actually read it to start with? I think they generally have two sets of text, one which they know what it's supposed to say, another one which they're not quite sure of. So you type so you type it all in, you don't know which one's the real one, and then they know if you've got half of it right, then, you're, then you're, they'll let you in. It's quite good, though, that we're turning something which is there to, to battle nefarious activities and turn it to a, a beneficial purpose, isn't yeah. it? It's quite neat. It's like those things at home where you can use your computing power to search for new drugs or, or do climate models. It's or label galaxies good. as spiral or non-spiral and sort of left-hand and right-hand forms, the Galaxy Zoo, which was a big hit last year doing something similar, wasn't it? Cool. Talking of space science, though, uh, very interesting this week, scientists have actually sent not just bacteria into space, which they've done in the past, this, they've actually managed to, to send animals into space, expose them to the void of space and solar radiation, and then recover them back to Earth, and, and they've been able to survive the process. This is a tiny organism called a tardigrade, which are about a millimetre long at most. They live in the soil. They're water bears, aren't they? That's what they're called. If you ever see them, they do this really kind of little shuffly walk. They're you can see them with cute. a ma- magnifying glass. Yeah. If you go and get some soil from your garden and, and shake the soil through a fine sieve, then you will get these tiny things. They're, they're almost everywhere on Earth. Turns out they're just amazingly harsh. Though. They can stand they're robust. They can stand very harsh conditions. Better than cockroaches. Um, Ingemar Johnson, who works at the Christianstad University in Sweden, has got a paper in this week's Current Biology, where she and her colleagues teamed up with researchers at the European Space Agency, ESA, and they piggybacked, if you like, the Photon, F-O-T-O-N, M3 mission put some of these tardigrades up into space and they had three sets of exposures so they had both the organisms and their eggs which were exposed either just to the vacuum of space for a period of time either to the vacuum of space and a low level of ultraviolet radiation so just the uva and uvb so that's the least fierce of the ultraviolet rays or a third group got the whole works they got full-on solar radiation (laughs) yeah and and out of that they found that 100 percent survived exposure to the to the vacuum of space about 66 percent so two-thirds survived being exposed to a little bit of UV and the vacuum in space. And, and a handful actually survive the full-on action, which is amazing. And the reason they're so excited about this is that these organisms obviously have the ability to repair their cells and their DNA very, very well. And why that's important is that we're always looking for ways to repair our DNA better because things like cancer drugs, which are chemotherapy, work by, ta- by targeting certain vulnerable sets of cells, the cancer, more than healthy tissue. So if you could protect the healthy tissue by using the same technique perhaps that these bugs do, this would make the cancer stand out as more vulnerable. You could give more radiation, killing the cancer more, whilst uh, getting around having any side effects. So it's a very interesting piece of work and, and will be interesting to try and work out how they are so resistant and resilient, even to space. So maybe it'll be them that survive the nuclear explosion rather than the cockroaches. Indeed. Now, you may have thought think there's lots of different kind of beers. Now, one of the reasons why beers are different is to do with the kind of yeast you use to grow them. And scientists at Yale University have been studying the family tree of these yeasts, um, the ones which are used to grow, brew lagers. To do this, they've been studying DNA from the yeasts, um, which have been used to make fairly modern beers and ones that have been preserved um, up to 130 years old. They discovered that there's two major families of these yeasts, the ones which are used to brew SARS beers such as Pilsner and Budweiser, and yeast used to make Froberg um, beers such as Heineken and Orange Boom. Both families are thought to be the consequence of the Bavarian legal system. In the 15th century, it was made illegal to brew beer in the summer. Do we know why? Well, apparently, the beer that they were making at the time was always ruined by high temperatures you get in the summer, so there was no point in doing it. It would be a waste of um, grain making the beer, so it was made illegal. Um, so the brewing, all the brewing was done in very cold winters in Bavaria. Now, conventional brewing yeast, which is S. Cervesi... Thank you, Cervesi. Um, ...doesn't survive well in these temperatures, and the, um, but the yeasts which survive well don't produce much alcohol. Fortuitously, though, at some point in this period, the brewing yeast into bread with S. Banyanus... And yes, uh, I'm sure Cat will help me at some point, um, which thrives at these low temperatures, but um, doesn't make much alcohol. Um, the SARS, in fact, it happened twice for the two different families. The SARS yeast is a normal hybrid of the two with, with two sets of chromosomes, but the Froberg yeast is actually triploid with three sets of tri- um of chromosomes with two two sets of chromosomes from the brewer's yeast. Um, they found that neither strain had lost many of the genes to survive the low 
temperatures, but um, and but lots of them have got lots and lots of the genes you need to make good beer, lots of alcohol cut, chopping up um, things. Unfortunately, this is probably going to, it's going to be very hard to do any genetic ma- manipulation on these yeasts because they're infertile, because they're a hybrid between two different species. Um, but possibly in the future you might be able to use this um, system of uh, hybridising two yeasts to make some more interesting beers. But do they know why they decided to merge their gene- two, two different strains of yeast decided at some point? if they could decide, of course, to merge their genetic material like that. Well, I guess you've got two strong selection pressures if you're brewing yeast in the cold. One of them is uh, brewing beer in the cold. One of them is to get a yeast which will survive the cold. And the other one is the people are going to be selecting the ones which make good beer. So there's going to be a really strong selection pressure that if they happen to cross, then that beer, that yeast is going to get selected really strongly. And a slightly related story that's about diet. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but back in July, a team of Greek researchers working as part of EPIC, the largest study of diet and cancer ever undertaken, showed that the more Mediterranean a person's diet is, the lower their risk of cancer. Now, that means a diet that contains lots of fruit, veg, grains, nuts and fish, all the good stuff, a little splash of olive oil, but it's low in red and processed meat, low in alcohol and low in dairy and animal fats. Well, now, an analysis of 12 international studies of diet and disease published in the British Medical Journal has shown that a strict Mediterranean diet can actually help to reduce deaths from other diseases as well as cancer. That includes heart disease, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease as well. Now, collectively, these studies covered more than 1.5 million people whose diet and health were tracked for 3 to 18 years. And this is something known as a meta-analysis. It's where they get all these big studies and kind of do all the number crunching to crunch them together and get some meaningful results. And all the studies that were investigated used a score to work out how Mediterranean your diet was. So, for example, if you eat lots and lots of fruit and veg, you you get a score. Uh, If you eat lots of grains, you get a score. If you eat lots of processed meat, you lose points. And the researchers found overall that people who stuck strictly to their Mediterranean diet had a 9% drop in overall death rates, including a 9% cut in deaths from heart disease, 13% drop in the incidence of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, and 6% cut in cancer incidence as well. And the researchers think that this could be quite effective for preventing cancer if you can kind of try and trick people in maybe to scoring their diets, so try and get their points up on the Mediterranean score, because that will be helping them to to prevent cancer and, and these other diseases as well. That's really interesting because what it shows is rather than it just being an observational thing, these people in this part of the world who eat this diet seem to live longer, which could be for a variety of reasons. Actually, you're saying you can take any population, change their diet along the same lines, and they get a benefit showing it's the diet that must be beneficial. Well, it's the diet that's definitely beneficial. We still don't know much about people who dramatically change their habits um there's probably likely to be a benefit we know that that the healthier you eat the more fruit and veg you eat um the more you stick to your ideal weight these are all beneficial the thing about humans though is that we tend not to really change our habits so the key thing is is to really sort of get grounded in good habits when you're younger so a glass of olive oil as you light up that cigarette cat maybe yeah no that's not gonna work thanks Anna. <laughs> all of those stories and the references to those stories will be on our website nakedscientist.com you can go to nakedscientist.com forward slash news to find out more about any of those now on the subject of heart disease and strokes and things one of the biggest killers actually of all humankind is heart disease and about one person in every three will ultimately die of a heart attack or heart disease as a consequence of that being the case Uh, but now there may be a new way to tackle heart disorders and daria moshley rosen is a researcher at stanford in america and she's come up with a way well, a new way perhaps to recreate a condition called cardiac preconditioning. This is where the heart in some way becomes resistant to the effects of stress and reduced oxygen and blood flow, perhaps because uh, you've had that for a while. So if you have preconditioning, you're resistant to those effects. So she's actually found a way of minimising the damage to hearts if you give animals a certain drug. And we're now going to find out whether or not this might work in humans. Hello, Daria. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Thank you for having me. So tell us a bit about this research. Well, it started, as you told uh, the audience, with a quest to understand how the heart is managing to protect itself from damage if a a full-blown heart attack occurs. Uh, Quite a few uh, researchers were trying to see if we can put it in a bottle, so to speak. And so uh, the approach we took is to look at a number of agents that uh, give the heart a preconditioning-like effect and see whether something in common can pop up. And what we found is that this enzyme um, uh, called aldehyde dehydrogenase is the one that changes more consistently with the amount of damage that there is in the heart after heart attack. 
um, or a model of heart attack. So the, the bigger the damage, the lower the activity of the enzyme. The smaller the damage, the higher the activity of the enzyme. So is your theory then that what's going on in people who have long-standing heart disease, the heart, by being stressed makes more of this enzyme so that if someone then has a heart attack they're more protected whereas if someone has a heart attack out of the blue they have low levels of this enzyme and therefore the heart is more damaged actually what's interesting is it's not that the heart is making more of the enzyme but it actually makes it a little bit more active so it takes the same enzyme that it has all the time but just makes it a little bit more active and we were interested to understand how it, that it happens and we found the mechanism but then we thought this is all a correlation that the increase in the activity of the enzyme is really uh, correlating with decreased damage. And how does the enzyme work, Daria? It is getting rid of this, what we call free radicals, these nasty things that accumulate in the organ when there is less oxygen and nutrients. Um, in fact, free radicals are accumulating in a variety of diseases, and this enzyme is one of the important enzymes that get rid of those uh, very reactive uh, agents that accumulate in the organ during these ischemic events, these heart attack events. And how are you managing to increase the levels of the enzyme in your experimental system? Yeah, so, so what we do is we do not increase the level of the enzyme, but we increase its activity. We, we search for a small molecule that can enhance the activity of the enzyme by screening uh, hundreds of thousands of molecules uh, in a sensitive assay. And we found this uh, little molecule, the little molecule be, being more or less the size of aspirin, that can increase the activity of the enzyme by about uh, twofold. And this is in animals, presumably? That's absolutely just rats. Yeah, no, nothing has been done in, in animals other than rats. And it's important to point out that um, studies in rats, uh, as much as they're encouraging they are, they are not uh, really telling you unequivocally whether it will work in humans. It needs to be determined. Sure, but it's a guide, isn't it? So you would put this molecule into the animal uh, or the human in the future and it would in some way increase the activity of their own aldehyde dehydrogenase enzyme. This would protect the heart in the context of a heart attack. So how much damage do you think you could prevent happening with this strategy? Yeah, in the rats, when we know exactly when the event will occur, since we are inducing it, we can reduce the damage by 60%. In humans, as, as you know, we unfortunately don't know when a patient will have a heart attack and um, how long the heart attack will be and so on. So it is difficult to determine how much protection you will have. But we are particularly encouraged uh, with this finding uh, for users uh, in scenarios other than just heart attack. For example, during bypass surgery, when, when there is a period uh, that is determined by the surgeon in which the oxygen and nutrients to the heart are reduced. Uh, we also think that it will be able to protect the brain, for example, during these periods of uh, low flow of blood to the, to the body. Thank you very much, Daria. Thank you. That's Daria Moshley Rosen, who's a researcher at Stanford University and has found a way to protect the heart, potentially, from heart disease in the future. So let's keep an eye peeled on that one. Bringing the facts to bear. The Naked Scientists. You are listening to The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith, Kat Arney and Dave Ansell. Don't forget that we're also all over the world because we're beaming this programme live into Second Life from 6pm UK time, that's 10am Second Life time. There's a great group of avatars out there who discuss the science in the show, ask us questions, so if you want to join them, do visit the Scilands search for the naked scientists and drop by our palatial mansion you can relax on one of our sound uh, sun lounges and listen to the show and while you're online why not tell us how we can make the show even better we do want to hear from you about what you like what you dislike about the show so we set up a survey at the naked slash survey thank you cat now it's that time as it is every week where we find out a bit of experimental science that you can do at home. Dave, what have you got for everyone this week? Well, this week I've got a bit of, cha of a challenge for you at home. Um, all you'll need is a potato and possibly a few drinking straws, perfectly normal plastic drinking straws. Now, the challenge is that I want you to get the drinking straw as far as you can into the potato, essentially impaling it um, with using no special tools, no knives, no power drills, nothing like that. You've just got to get the straw in the potato just using your hands as far as you can. OK, let's just get Dr okay. Cat to have a quick okay. go um, and see. Right. <laughs> okay, that was rubbish. a success story. She has managed okay. to bend the straw without got, actually getting hang on, it. I've got it. Oh, no, no, I've got it in a little bit. We're measuring that in millimetres, I think. So, Dave, as, a, as a challenge, how far, if people are doing this really well, do you think they ought to be able to get the straw 
into the potato. You should definitely be able to get it in about an inch if you're good, maybe two inches. <laughs> half a centimetre. <laughs> so there you go, that can be improved on. It's a work in progress over there with Dr Cat. So basically, just summarise, Dave, what people have to do. Um, take a normal plastic drinking straw and a potato and try and get the drinking straw as far as you can into that potato using any means you like, which doesn't involve anything other than your hands, the straw and the potato. So that is a bit of kitchen science for you to try at home. If you'd like to have a go, the email address is chris at thenakedscientist.com and it is, of course, our science Q&A show. Any science question goes, we're going to start hacking in some of these emails shortly. Cat got a question for you here, which is from Tom, Tom Childs, in fact, and he says, why is it that some smells disappear with continued smelling? Well, the answer here is something called adaptation or desensitisation, and it's the same reason why you're not sitting there going, oh, gosh, I'm wearing clothes, oh, I'm sitting on a seat, all the time. Um, basically, if, if that happened, if our nerves responded to every stimulus we're getting all the time, we would just be overwhelmed and not know what to do. So what happens if you're sniffing vinegar or something, a really strong smell, goes under your nose, up into your nose, and it, it activates something called olfactory neurons. These are basically smelling nerve cells up in your nose and they send a signal to your brain that says this is a really strong smell, this is what it smells like. Um, but after a while, the, the signals that are being sent by those neurons are in the form of chemicals, little chemical messengers and, uh, and they kind of get worn out, they run out of chemicals in these cells and something called desensitisation happens. So you stop being able to smell the smell. Now this is very important because say if you're, you know, if you think back to our, our ancestors sitting around in the jungle or in their cave, you want to spot new things happening to you. You don't need to, to know about what's going on that's already happening to you. You want to spot new stuff. So if something like a very strong smell, you need to spot it when it's new and when it's happening so it can, you know, be over the level of all the noise that's going on around you. So what happens if um, if you're smelling a strong smell, after a while, you'll stop smelling it, basically. And anyone who's uh, lived with boys and particularly whiffy toilet habits will know this. But uh, I think the evidence is, Kat, that <laughs> men and women make equal amounts of smells equal often, equally often during yeah, the day. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that wonderful yeah, answer. Okay. Dave, here's a quick one for you. This is from Brian, and we also had the same question from Joe, uh, Joe Dweck, and they both ask, how does a Newton's cradle work? Because Brian says, in high school, I was taught that the mass times velocity equals mass times velocity. In other words, one ball in means one ball out. So he's saying, the teacher pulled back two balls then and let go. The two balls at the other end of the contraption went up about the same distance as the first two balls. But why didn't just one ball fly off at twice the speed, for example? OK, so a Newton's cradle is a whole series of collisions. Um, you're taking a, a really bouncy metal ball, it's a very, very hard steel ball, and bouncing it into a row of them um, from one end and crashing into it. Now, in this kind of collision, there's two things which you conserve, so you've got the same, have the same amount of it at the end as you had at the beginning. One of them is energy that you were talking about before. That's half times the mass times velocity squared. The other one's something called momentum, which is your mass times the velocity. Now, if you dropped um, two balls into it, you drop one ball into it with a mass and a velocity. Um, you can you can obviously get, have the same amount of mass and velocity by having one ball coming out at the same speed as you started with, because that would be the same amount of energy and the same amount of momentum. If you had two balls to the same amount of energy, then um, they'd actually be moving less than half the speed, so they'd have less than the same amount of momentum that you put in. So the only solution is to have the same number of balls coming out as went in. Is it not also that there's a little tiny delay between one ball hitting and then the next ball hitting and so you get two separate collisions throwing off two separate balls? So when you go two balls in, you get two balls out because it spits one ball and then the next ball out? Um, that would I mean, that'd be another way of looking at it. Most of these physics can be looked at different ways. Thank you, Dave. Um, I've got an interesting email, which I'm just going to read here, because, um, in fact, it's not a question. It was more of a, a, wow, this is amazing. And I want to get you guys' uh, re sort of response to this. Um, this is actually from Eric, um, Eric Moser, and his brother, Robert Moser. Um, Eric's in uh, Memony Falls, WI, and Robert's in Boston in Massachusetts. And they have said, the molecules in a single drop of water diluted evenly throughout the Earth's oceans would result in a density of one molecule per litre of seawater. So in other words, if you made one little drop of water go into the sea somewhere, given enough time, all there's enough molecules in that one drop to spread out across the whole oceans, the whole of the Earth's oceans, so there was one drop in each litre. And they've asked me to check the math, so you can check with me and tell me if I'm right here. So this is what they did. They said... There are about 24,000 droplets in one litre. Now, that's right, because I've checked that, and, and that gives you a droplet volume of about 0.03 uh, centimetres cubed. So that's about right. Um, the relative molecular mass of water is 18 grams per mole. 
OK, now a mole is the number of molecules, is the weight. If you have one mole of something, then it means that that is the... If you take the one mole of something, it's the mass in grams of the molecule in one mole. So that's a, that. you need that to calculate the next bit of the equation. So they said in one litre, there must be a 1,000 divided by 18 moles because the molecular mass of water is 18. Now, we know from Avogadro's constant that there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules in a mole of something. So that means that in a litre of water, there must be 1,000 divided by 18 times 6.022 times 10 to the power of 23 molecules in a litre. And that means per droplet, you have to divide that number by 24,000 because we've already said there are 24,000 droplets in a litre. Now, that means that there must be 1.39 times 10 to the 21 molecules of water in an individual droplet of water, which is an amazing number of molecules, isn't it, when you think about it? They've said the, the volume of the Earth's oceans is 1.37 times 10 to the 9 cubic kilometres. That, that's a, a reasonably well-understood figure. And if you need to convert that into uh, initially metres cubed, you have to times it by a 1,000 cubed because there's a 1,000 metres in a kilometre. So that's times it by 10 to the power of 9. And then to turn that into litres, you've got to times it by a 1,000 cubed again. So that's 10 to the power of 12. So that means that there are on Earth 1.37 times 10 to the 21 litres. Now, that's nearly the same number as there are molecules in the droplet of water. So if you dive one into the other, you have almost one, dr one molecule of water per litre of water on Earth, which is... I think, really quite amazing. It's pretty impressive. I remember my chemistry teacher telling me something like that, but I wasn't really paying attention at well, the look, time. Well, tell, tell us, Kat, now, <laughs> tell us about this sunscreen question, because we had this asked by two people. Um, Alan is in Sydney, and Sean Moore is in Canada, and they both have the sort of same question. Alan says, I read that you need to spend about 10 to 20 minutes each day in the sun to allow vitamin D to form in the body. But since I moved to Australia, I've also been told how important it is to wear sunblock. So my question is, does wearing sunblock affect the rate that vitamin D gets formed at, or is there no difference? The answer is, yes, it does. But in fact, for most healthy people, you should be thinking about wearing the sun cream rather than worrying about your vitamin D. The simple reason is this, is that sunblock does block ultraviolet radiation, which is the stuff that helps you make vitamin D. It's also the stuff that damages your skin and gives you skin cancer, which is why, particularly in somewhere hot and sunny like Australia, it's very highly recommended you protect yourself in that way. Um, but you do only need a few minutes of sun exposure to make more than enough vitamin D, and it's certainly less than the time it takes for your skin to go red or to burn it's really hard to be prescriptive about how long do you need because it's different for every person i mean someone who's very fair like me i burn really really easily i'll probably need much less time in the sun than someone with much darker skin but also sunblock and sun cream are not perfect they're not this magic shield against the sun people don't use them in the way that manufacturers recommend they don't put enough on they don't apply it regularly enough and you'll know you know particularly if you're someone that burns easily that you can put sun cream on and still get burnt there's still ultraviolet getting through through. Um, we know that there are some studies that show that we do need vitamin D certainly to maybe protect us from things like cancer but you can certainly get more than enough vitamin D with what we call casual exposure to the sun you know popping to the shops with your sleeves up and uh, but if you're going to go serious exposure to the sun definitely protect yourself. Thank you very much, Kat. Now, um, quick update. Don't forget our kitchen science experiment this week. Take a bendy drinking straw, nothing special about the straw, and a big potato, not a cooked potato. has to be a raw potato. And how far can you get the straw to go into the potato? Dave reckons if you do it the right way, you should be able to get it about an inch or an inch and a half. And if you're Ben Valsler, muscle man, who's our producer, you can get it almost all the way through. Uh, the consensus from Second Life is you should maybe try twisting the straw. don't know if that's any good or not. And also, Pookie Amsterdam says... I say it depends on the angle of attack. The potato has a structure where you can enter it at one angle, maybe better than the other, so perhaps that's part of it. Who knows? Anyway, there's been some big science news this week. Not only has it been the LHC switch on, that's the Large Hadron Collider, but it's also been the BA Festival of Science. That's the British Association for the Advancement of Science Festival. And where there's a science festival, you have to have a naked scientist, so we sent Ben Valsler along. This year's BA Festival of Science was held in Liverpool a city more famous for football and the Beatles than for science. But with hundreds of talks to hear and events to join in with, Liverpool played a wonderful host. Over the last week, we've heard why surgery may be the only option for the morbidly obese, why binge drinking as a teenager could permanently change your brain, why performing conjuring tricks could do magic for your social skills. But first, the BA always attracts some of the biggest names in science, keen for an opportunity to engage with the public, and this year was no exception. 
Lord Robert Winston, better known for his work on fertility, dropped into the festival to exercise his position as Chair of Science and Society at Imperial College London. In a talk all about the impact of science and technology on our society, held at Liverpool's Philharmonic Hall, Lord Winston explained how we need to understand that scientific advance has both its ups and its downs. Well, I think it's fair to say that all technology has a downside as well as an upside. Every technology we've produced, be it the stone hand axe, farming, farming produced huge all sorts of diseases which we didn't have before, and it also resulted in narrowing the lack of diversity in crops, and also made us much more vulnerable to global warming, for example, climate change. Cities was probably the next technology 8,000 years ago, which of course resulted in a much higher death rate because of the spread of disease, water supply and so on. Transport, the wheel, energy, of course, comes into this as well. I mean, everything you think about is at one level leading us down a very dark slope. But I don't believe that we should be depressed, I think we should be reflective and I think we should be optimistic that actually if we show proper responsibility, we can combat things like global warming, we can combat the risks that nuclear fission uh, present and use them wisely. But in order to do that, I think we have to have a very clear idea of what the responsibility of the scientist is. I think we have to have a much clearer idea of our ethical responsibility, our commercial responsibility our responsibilities to society, and above all, I as a scientist have to recognise, like all other scientists, pretty well all other scientists, that the science we do is not the science belonging to me. It's not my science. The science belongs to society because society essentially is paying for it, and its negative effect is also an effect on society. So we have to have a much clearer understanding that we have to have a much better responsibility to the society, and that responsibility implies better citizenship from scientists. Now, scientists don't like that message very much, but that is changing, I think. Do you think that scientists have a responsibility to provide society with the science that they want or the science that they need? It's a very, very interesting question, and it's one that is always being asked by the research councils. I sit on the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, and it's a question we ask ourselves to some extent in in council. I think we have to lead, providing the science that we think is most appropriate to society. But I think we also actually have to be very clear that we have to listen to society when we do that, and we have to have a dialogue, and we need to be able to explain very clearly why we are pursuing that particular area of research in relation to another area which we don't regard quite so highly or whatever. And I think that's really important now when there are so many examples in the things that we found. If you take the EPSRC, for example, synthetic biology, nanotechnology, the digital economy, all of which have very serious downsides. The digital economy because of surveillance, synthetic biology because of the potential of creating life which actually might run amok and infect humans, and nanotechnology because we may produce toxic effects that we can't really control. I mean, these are all theoretical constructs, but they are issues. And therefore, I think that we need to be very, very switched on to the fact that society, particularly democratic society, is highly literate, very intelligent, and equally capable of dealing with the issues as we are. But if they're denied the possibility, then of course I think we run into trouble. So it's not true to say that uh, regulation is hampering science? Well, regulation needn't hamper science. Um, Regulation can actually promote science. And on the whole, I think regulation can be a, a huge advantage to science. You know, if you demonstrate that your regulators are making sure that you're doing stuff ethically... That's a fantastic advantage. Unfortunately, in Britain, we definitely live unquestionably in an overregulated society. We are risk-averse, and unfortunately, it goes right through our society. That's why school children can't do scientific experiments, because of health and safety. I want to change that and bring them into Imperial College to do those dangerous experiments. But that is not healthy for our society. You know, the idea that our children can't roam around to explore the world around them because there are paedophiles behind every tree. It's a nonsense. There's no evidence of it that knife attacks are much more prevalent now. Actually, the statistics show the reverse. Even though the newspapers and the police and government talk about knife attacks all the time, knife attacks aren't more common. We've become a society which is not actually prepared to face the realities of what real risk is. Here in Liverpool for the BA, Liverpool is also this year's European City of Culture. Surely it's a good thing that there's a science festival in the city of culture. They're they're far too often thought of as being separate things. 
I agree completely. Science is part of our culture. It's a key part of our culture. The difference with the scientific culture is something in educational terms. You know, we read Shakespeare in school as part of our culture, and we read Hamlet as one of the greatest plays in the English language, which was written in 1599. The difference between the science of chemistry and what happens in Hamlet is quite simple. The text of Hamlet fundamentally hasn't changed since the first folio was published. The text of chemistry, of course, changes month by month. And that does make the educational issue rather a special one. That's the need to constantly update teachers to give them better career development and so on. And we're not doing that very well in Britain. And that's something that we need to look at. But you're absolutely right. There's no question that if we saw science as part of our culture, as important as the music that goes on in this place, or as important as the theatre, we would be a healthier society, unquestionably. And the swarms of people who attended Lord Winston's talk would no doubt agree that a night of science is just as exciting, entertaining and important as the finest opera or the best of the Bard's plays. Next year, the BA will be held in Guildford, and if this week has been anything to go by, we can expect yet another week of great science. Thank you very much, Ben. That's Ben Valsler, who was up in Liverpool this week for the BA Festival. And this is The Naked Scientist with Chris, Cat and Dave. If you have any science questions for us, the email address is chris at thenakedscientist.com if you'd like to get in touch with us. Now, I've got a question here for you, Chris. It's from Mark Wolford. He said that he's been on a beach recently, he got an L-shaped lump of stone and threw it in the water, but all the ripples were circular. Why is that? Well, it's, it's a common thing, isn't it? When you see this happen, you think, why don't I get an L-shaped ripple going out? But the answer is that when you first throw something into the water, say a stick or something like that, yes, you will get a stick shape initial ripple but as the ripples begin to spread out then you'll get the l-shaped bit going out a bit but then what about the spaces what about the gaps between them well they'll get filled in with a curve and eventually as it goes further and further out you'll end up with something which is predominantly curve with very little of the original shape left behind so it looks to all intents and purposes like a giant circle so in other words the contribution of the original shape is absolutely tiny so that's why it actually does that that interesting morphing into a circle from something which was an original different shape so all the ripples are going outwards at the same speed and if you they start off in slightly different positions but after a couple of seconds those different positions they start on doesn't make much difference and so it's approximately a circle. in the grand scheme of things no that's right interesting thing here from colin dave who's saying i was listening to a recent program where you discussed pressurizing the air inside an aeroplane and listeners were saying that they'd been on planes and their ears had popped but why do they pressurize the plane asks colin to only eight thousand feet well, why don't they pressurize it to atmospheric pressure why bother why bother fiddling around with it why not have ground level pressurization at all heights um well they did start doing this on the first jet airliner which was the comet um and they also had lovely square windows um and they the airplane kept being pumped all the way up to full atmospheric pressure or it kept rising up to the top of the high up in the atmosphere getting a big pressure on the structure then coming down again then coming up again then coming down again and that stress on the airframe slowly built up cracks and got longer and longer and longer until the cracks ran between all the windows and it opened up like opening up um, postage stamps and they actually lost several planes due to this now since that they've made the windows much more curved and they've also started not pressurising the plane all the way up, so you're putting less stress on it. You could design a plane which would survive the high pressure, but it would involve um, making it much heavier than they want to, and they want to make it as cheap as possible so you can fly... So you're, you're carting loads more weight into the air, yeah. which is costing you more fuel, and in these days of high fuel prices, that's a bad fuel thing. Fuel is money. And the other thing is that to actually to compress that um, f- uh, air, because you need more, more air all the time, you're compressing it from a low pressure outside to a high pressure inside the plane, and that takes lots of energy and more fuel as well. And also, Graham D on our forum pointed out that the actual weight of the air molecules themselves will contribute an extra 250 kilos. So basically, an average British large person or uh, several people my weight uh, basically travelling for free if you don't pressurise the aeroplane to atmospheric sea level pressure all the way up there. So that's pretty interesting. Kat, this is a good question for you. Um, Sophia says, how do you age your palm tree? There are no rings. You can't count them. So how do you do it? This is a really interesting one and it's very tough to date a palm tree because they don't have rings. This problem also applies... Especially if it's a date palm. (laughs) Yeah. Ba-dum-tsh. especially plants uh, also applies to plants such as giant cacti and yuccas that don't have that ring structure now in the case of really old palms you also can't really radiocarbon date them this works for trees because they have the a same consistent heartwood for all their lives but this doesn't really happen for palms now some botanists uh, use techniques which include counting leaf scars palm trees make new leaves leaves fall off you can count how many scars there are and kind of multiply it by the average time taken to grow new leaves but 
it's not great. And really the best technique is to try and look at historical information. If you can find out what, when an area was colonised by humans, if the tree's not a native species, they probably brought it with them. Uh, you can look at sort of old written records, historical records, paintings, photos. There's not really a very good way to age a palm tree, sadly. Wow, I didn't know that it was yeah, such a problem. It's, it's difficult. Intriguing. Dave, um, this is a question from um, Vince Magno. He points out, definitely not Mango. He says, why do crisp packets and sweet wrappers make so much noise? Well, I think this is quite a complicated one. I think one of the things is they're big. They're they're made out of sheets. They're big sheets. So if you uh, move them like a piece of paper, um, they any movements they ha- make um, very well connected to the air because they've got a large area. So if they move a bit, then the air has to move. So vibrations in them get transferred to the uh, air very easily. And also, if you take a piece of paper or a crisp packet and crumple it, it doesn't just kind of fold neatly and you get nice even folds. You tend to get complicated folds which actually become quite strong. And then when you break those, you actually um, release a load of energy which um, vibrates everything, which conducts the air, and so the air vibrates well and they make a lot of noise. Thank you very much, Dave, for that nice, noisy (laughs) illustration. Um, Got a quick question for you, Kat. This is from Jeremy Langdon, who says, I was wondering, is it true that the liver can grow back if you chop half half of it off? Could that be the answer for the thousands of people who are waiting? We turn the population into liver donors. Well, it is true that the liver grows back. It's pretty much the only organ in our bodies that has this amazing regenerative potential. You can pretty much cut away half of someone's liver and it will grow back again. It does sound like a fantastic idea for transplant patients, but sadly you'll still have the problem of tissue rejection, so you'd have to very, very carefully match it. Some people do offer to act as living donors. You know, you can donate kidneys, you can donate livers to people you're very closely related to because you're likely to have a very similar tissue type. Um, but obviously trying to remove part of someone's liver is pretty major surgery and it's not something that you'd want to go into lightly so really the problem of the thousands of people waiting for transplants is really to get more people to sign up for the organ donor register i'd say sure i think another problem with them um, the liver is i hear what you're saying but another issue with it is that if you do take away a big chunk of the liver then although the cells might have the capacity to replace lost cells and make up the cell numbers there won't be the architecture the structure there for the cells to hang around in other words to be to be strung for from in order to, to make a new liver so although you could make the cells back you couldn't necessarily make the same shape and the same structure so it would be very difficult for it to repair itself like that so I think there's more to it than well, just no, it will, gro- it will grow back, the liver will actually grow back in a couple of weeks after removing it, it's, it's really phenomenal um, in, in the case of cancer patients you can remove sort of 50-60% of someone's liver and it, and it will grow back Wow, that's a relief isn't it? <laughs> We've got a question here for you, Chris, um, from Michael. He says, could viruses be engineered to attack cancer cells um, selectively? Oh, no, they have been. And this is a really hot area because viruses are very bad for cells because they basically turn cells into virus factories. They will go into the cell, they will uh, grow very fast in the cell, turning it into a virus factory and kill the cell in the process. So researchers are thinking, well, if we can exploit that, then we might have a way of making the virus attack just a cancer and kill it. And there have been a number of uh, approaches to doing this. Um, Up in Scotland, Moira Brown, who's been on this programme, has been working on a strain of herpes simplex virus, the virus that causes cold sores, for example, and she's found a mutant form of the virus which has a a damage to a gene called gamma 34.5. And this gene, if you switch it off, stops the virus growing in brain tissue. Now, what this means is that if you have a brain tumour, you could inject the the, the cancer with this virus. And because the brain tumour is very fast-growing cells, the virus can still grow in those cells and it will replicate, making more virus, which will go into more cancer cells and kill those cells, which will go into more cancer cells. And the whole thing grows until it runs out of cancer cells and as soon as it hits the healthy tissue interface, where the healthy brain tissue is again, it switches off. And so this is viewed as a very powerful way to very selectively weed out the tumour cells, the aberrant tumour cells that are growing invasively between the healthy tissue without actually having to do radical damage with the scalpel to someone's brain. Would you have to have a different virus for each kind of cancer or would you be able to get one which would work the most? Well, not necessarily, but the likelihood is there's going to be horses for courses because some viruses naturally have a tropism, a tendency to go into certain cell types. So HIV, for example, tends to home in on white blood cells. So if you wanted to target a certain kind of disease of those white blood cells, you might use a virus to start with, which is very good at homing in on 
on certain types of tissue. Other times it's been a case of modifying the virus so that the receptors or docking stations on the surface of the cell are slightly different so that they will then go on to certain types of cells. But it's, it's a sort of work in progress, isn't it? Yeah, there's lots of research that's going on um, funded by Cancer Research UK in this area and ovarian cancer is a cancer that's really kind of ripe for virus treatment because mostly ovarian cancer tends to stay inside the tummy in the same place and uh, and so you can kind of inject the virus in there and it will get rid of all the cancer cells and there's some clinical trials that are currently underway lots of really exciting stuff going on Thank you, Kat. I think it's certainly a good time to be alive and maybe even a good time to be ill because there's lots of things we can do these days. And now it's time for our question of the week with the luminous and radiant Diana O'Carroll. I don't know if my head gets any bigger, I'm not going to be able to leave the studio this week. Uh, Anyway, this week we're going to be looking into a glowing issue. Hi, I'm Sandra and I'm calling from Melbourne. I was just wondering, is there any radiation that would come from a glow-in-the-dark watch that could be harmful to the wearer? So is there more to the warm glow of the dial that tells you it really is too early to get out of bed? Yeah, so hi, my name's Philip Clark. I work in the University of Edinburgh Experimental Particle Physics Group. And the answer to the question about whether glow-in-the-dark watches are radioactive depends very much on the type of dial that you're considering. By far the most common watch that you come across that's glow-in-the-dark is called a phosphorescent watch. And essentially the watch is coated in a paint which absorbs light and then re-emits them. Now these watches are completely harmless. The second type of watch is called a tritium watch. Now, so the modern way to do this is you have the same phosphorescent paint, but this time it's mixed with small tubes filled with tritium, and tritium is radioactive and emits beta particles. And these have the same effect of exciting the phosphorescent paint, but this time tritium has got a half-life of 12 years. So the beta particles that are emitted are not very energetic, so if anything they couldn't really penetrate even the outermost skin layer. Now the third type of watch I'd like to mention is called a radium watch, and And they have very much the same design, but this time instead of tritium, they're mixed with radium, and the half-life is 1,600 years. However, they may not seem to be as radioactive because the phosphor in the paint gets eaten up by the radium. And I've got a small demonstration here, so I've got an old watch I'm going to hold a Geiger counter to. Now, if I turn the Geiger counter on, you'll hear it clicking. And that's when I hold it slightly close to the watch. And if I hold it really close to the watch, and then take it away from the watch, then... The background count, you can hear the occasional random count just now, is very much lower than when you hold it close to the watch. So these watches are extremely radioactive. However, they're still generally not too harmful unless you were to, say, break the watch and inhale it or somehow ingest the watch. And on our forum, Rade came up with pretty much the same answer. Older watches with a little R or T on the back are likely to set off a Geiger counter, just like that, and could potentially be harmful, so you might want to keep it in a suitable container. The modern sort use phosphorescent chemicals such as zinc sulphide or strontium aluminate, which are only excited by sunlight and probably won't make you glow in the dark, unless you build yourself a cloak of watches, maybe? Uh, From glowing in the dark to sniffing in it, just how do sharks do it? Apparently, a shark can smell blood up to a quarter of a mile away. How does smell travel in water? It would seem strange that if you drop ink in water, it takes ages to dissipate. So how can the individual particles of a smell travel so far and apparently so fast? So if you know how sharks find their prey so efficiently or have any other questions, then get in touch by emailing chris at thenakedscientist.com or write us in our forum, which is full of all sorts of questions, answers and debates at thenakedscientist.com forward slash forum. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Diana. That was fantastic. See you next week. OK. And what Diana's referring to with the forum there is we have a, an online forum. You can go on our website and you can put in your questions and other people who are all around the world can answer them for you and also you can have a chat to them. So if you want to join in, that's thenakerscientist.com forward slash forum. Keeping you abreast of the world's best science, The Naked Scientists. This is The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith, Kat Arney and with Dave Ansell. It's our science phone in extravaganza. Lots of questions coming in. We'll come to some of those in a second. But first, let's go back to Dave's exciting experiment where he was impaling potatoes. Don't ever become a medical doctor, Dave. Uh-oh. I've seen your operating <laughs> skills. What's all this about? OK, so what we asked you to do was to get a potato and uh, just a normal plastic straw and to try and get it as far into the potato as you can. OK, let's find out how far Barry got his straw in. Hi, Barry. Hello there. Welcome to the Naked Scientist. Have you are you straw and potato in hand? No, um, I demonstrated this on a cruise ship <laughs> a, few, a couple of years ago. I won't ask what kind of cruises you go on, but what what was your interpretation? Um, well, what you've got to do is increase the rigidity of the straw. That's fairly basic. How do you do that? Um, well, with air pressure. 
if you hold the straw from the end you intend to stab into the potato, the diameter of the potato plus a quarter of an inch, and then with you know lots of energy propel it into the potato, as it penetrates the potato, the air pressure will go up in the straw, therefore making it more rigid. And the further you go in, the more the air pressure increases. And at the last little bit, there's so much air pressure in there, it actually propels the slug of potato out the other side and the straw goes with it. Dave, what do you think? I'm not entirely sure whether you need the air pressure because it certainly works very well even if you don't plug the end of the straw and the straw's moving less than the speed of sound, so I doubt the air pressure is going to go up very much. Anyway, the, the general strategy is if you try and push the straw in very slowly, like Kat was trying earlier, it just breaks. But if you take a straw, and I, if you want to try this, cat. Okay, yeah. Take the straw, potato, got my straw. And hold it v- kind of gently, but firmly, but not distorting the straw at all. Gently, but firmly. Yeah. Is it where that kind of makes sense? Um, and then try and stab it into the potato as straight as you can into a piece of potato which is at right angles the way you're stabbing it to. So you're going to get okay. a nice flat piece of potato. Flat and potato, straw, ready, one, two, three. Crikey! <laughs> That's actually pretty impressive. Has it come out the other side? It looks almost like Massive. it could have done. Let's pull it. Oh, gosh. Uh, that's about, what, two and a half inches? Oh, it's good, good two inches anyway, yeah, I think. Crikey. So, <laughs> that's amazing. So, Dave, what's going on? Okay. Well, basically, a straw is a tube, and tubes are very, very strong as long as they're straight. So I, if you take a straw and try and squash it, as long as it stays straight, it's very, very strong. But as soon as it starts to bend, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker until eventually it buckles and fails and gets incredibly weak and just can't do anything at all. Um, so basically, the straw to get in there, it wants to be as straight for as long as you can when it's going through that potato. Now, if you go slowly, it's got plenty of time to bend and buckle and fail. But if you go very quickly... It, the, the buckling takes some time, so you, it hasn't had time to buckle by, for, by the time it's gone all the way into the potato and it stabs in very quickly. Also, if you look at a straw, it's got a very, very small surface area, so it's a bit like a knife, so it cuts very easily. And if you go quickly, you're, it's a bit like cutting something with an axe. If you push slowly, it's, it doesn't go in very easily, but if you hit it quickly with an axe, it, um, you just, you're just cutting the very, very surface where the knife blade is. You're not spreading the force out at all and it'll cut better. So go quickly and it'll go I'd give well. Barry 9 out of 10, though, because he was right. He very, said you've got to increase the rigidity, so yeah. it's sort of on the on the way to being completely right, wasn't it? Very, very good. Um, where does this apply in the real world, though? Because that's the key thing here, isn't it? Well, if you've ever looked at columns in buildings, um, if you if you look at things hanging off, hanging in a big building, all the pe- bit the things which can do it can be very very thin. They look like just weedy little bits of string, but they can hold up huge bits of building. But if you look at anything which is um, trying to fight a compression, like we were here, it's always got to be very wide. Because if you take something very narrow, it's very easy to bend. And once it starts bending, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker and buckles and fails. But if you, the wider it is, the stiffer it is. So it can't buckle, and so it can't fail by compression. I wondered if you were going to say something about cars having crumple zones. Because if you drive into something, cars are, are programmed. Met, met, the metal is sort of pre-programmed, isn't it, to bend in a certain way and soak up the energy? Yeah, they're, they're designed not to be stiff, not to be strong. So you, so they already have um, little bits of failure in the place where a buckle it built in, so it breaks easily. Thanks, Dave. An absolutely fantastic experiment. There'll be more kitchen science next week, but if you can't wait until then, then you can support The Naked Scientists and do that by picking up a copy of our new book. It's called Crisp Packet Fireworks, and we've written up 50 of the best kitchen science experiments from the last few years for you to try at home. And there are details of how you can pick up a copy of that on our website at nakedscientist.com forward slash kitchen science. Got a couple of minutes left, so let's have a look at some more questions. Cat uh, Marie, not sure what she's got in mind here, uh, says, just a quick question. If you happen to have your jugular vein or brachial artery or femoral artery cut, how long will it take for you to bleed out? I was having a heated discussion with someone about it. He says 36 hours. I say he's nuts. It would just be a matter of minutes. Who's right? Well, I think you are. Um, basically, if you have a major art- uh, injury to a major vein or artery, you could be dead in less than a minute um, from loss of blood. I mean, this obviously happens all the time in serious accidents. Uh, very, very nasty stuff. Um, basically, you, you just have this massive drop in blood pressure, can't supply blood to your brain, can't supply blood to your heart. You conk out pretty quickly. If it's in terms of you know getting all the blood out of you, um, it probably wouldn't take that long 
either, but you know, you, it's very difficult to get all the blood out of an organism. If you think anyway. about it, you've got it's a cardiac output of five litres a minute. Yeah. So, in other words, your aorta, your main blood vessel, has got five litres of blood running through it every minute, and your circulating volume, the amount of blood in your body, is about five litres. Yeah. So, at most, if you cut someone's aorta, if they had an aneurysm that burst, they could potentially lose all the blood in their body in one minute. Yeah, you'd be in trouble. I mean, and also, you know, bleeding for 36 hours is extremely unlikely unless you had some condition like haemophilia which meant you couldn't clot so basically you're right they're wrong you win dave one for you a nice easy question for you to go home on uh this is sri adiptala soma seka who says if light has no mass how can a black hole capture it Cheers. um okay now light although it uh light has no mass but it is affected by the shape of space and what einstein worked out in general relativity was if you have a very large mass it distorts the shape of space and if you shine light around a curve pe- across a curved piece of space it will get bent by it a black hole is just basically so heavy that it bends space so much that light will will get bent a bit like a lens and come straight back into the black hole again thank you dave so that's why they look black because just yeah, there's no, no light, light coming out. back out Thank you. A question from Ian, who is in Sprouston. He says, what makes our hair turn grey? And is it true that things like fright and stress can make that happen? Well, Ian, the reason hair goes grey is that hair naturally is a white colour. It's, that's the colour of the protein, keratin, which hair is made from. And you have in the hair follicle, which is a special ring of stem cells in the surface of your head, under your arms and in other places on the body, uh, cells called melanocytes, which make melanin, the same stuff that gives you a suntan when you go out in the sun. And melanocytes add to the hair melanin. In fact, they add different chemical forms of melanin, pheomelanin and eumelanin. And this is a dark colour. And so depending upon what ratios of these things you put in and how, they, how much of it is in the hair, the hair goes darker. So if you have, uh, for some reason, a loss of those melanocytes, they stop making the melanin, then the hair goes back to its natural white colour. So basically what happens is as we age, the melanocytes burn out in the hair follicles, they stop making this particular chemical, and as a result, you unfortunately go grey. As to whether it, it happens overnight, I think you looked into this, Kat, and the question was, it, it's more likely that people's hair might fall out and then it comes back white because they were going to go grey anyway. Exactly, it's something like that. It's very unlikely to happen over such a short length of time. There's no real biological mechanism there. Thank you, Kat. Well, that's it for this week. Very big thank you to you for joining in with the show and thank you to our production team, Ben Vowsler, Marisintha Lingham, um, Tom Simpkins and Diana O'Carroll. Next week, of course, we're going to be looking at the science of the superbug and new ways to tackle things like MRSA. Do join us if you can. The Naked Scientist podcast is supported by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at nakedscientist.com.